the Law Center at King Hall. Her resume is in your pamphlet, which I direct. Uh, you also should note that she was a law clerk for United States District Court Judge Prentice Marshall in Chicago and for United States Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. Ladies and gentlemen, Diane Marie Amen on the subject of women at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. Diane? Thank you, Greg, and good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I am very grateful to uh, David Crane for inviting me. It is an invitation that actually came as a result of a blog post that I did. You may have noticed that um, something called the Intlaw Girls blog is one of the co-sponsors of this event. And the way that that came about was on this, the first occasion of these dialogues, uh, David announced that there would be a dialogue of, of international prosecutors. And um, in the list of attendees, there were no women. And on the blog, which is devoted to um, giving women space to talk about international law and the work that they do in it, I noted that there were no women. And that was quite interesting because the chief prosecutors of the ICTY had included two women, Louise Arbour and Carla Del Ponte, and that it was disturbing that they had been omitted and no assistance had been invited. And I have to give David incredible props, I guess is the current word today, because rather than taking offense at what I hope was a gentle chiding, um, he took it to heart and he said, this is a wonderful topic. We need to talk about women in international criminal law. And he devoted this entire program to the subject rather than um, being concerned. I am quite sure, and I was sure when I wrote the blog post, that both Arbour and Del Ponte had probably been invited or others and they weren't able to come. But it had seemed like an omission that I needed to bring to attention. And so I'm just really grateful, David, to be here. The, topic that I'm going to talk about, it's not quite women at the International Military Tribunal because as John so forcefully has told us, there was essentially one. Um, I'm going to talk more broadly about women at Nuremberg. Um, not so much the first trial of the major war criminals, but the subsequent trials of which there were many, often organized by subject matter, the justice case, judges who had, had uh, perpetrated miscarriages of justice in their courtroom, the doctor's trial, the, the uh, physicians who conducted medical experiments um, in the concentration camps, the industrialist trials, of which there were three, and then to a smaller extent, some of the military proceedings that were um, taken, undertaken in uh, the British and French zones. It wasn't only Americans who were engaging in the process of war crimes tribunals at the time. But most of them took place in or around Nuremberg, and so that's what I'll talk about. Now, I should say that many of us who work in this field owe our interest to international criminal law, at least in part, to the Nuremberg trials. That's certainly so in my case. Cementing my own interest in this area was Telford Taylor's indispensable memoir, written in 1992 and called The Anatomy of the Nuremberg Trials. At a much more exalted level, Judge Pile, now the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, apparently also came to her interest in international criminal law through the Nuremberg Trials. I've come across an article that reports that she came across the Nuremberg Trials on a shelf in the library at the University of Natal in apartheid South Africa. As a student enrolled for classes for non-whites, Judge Pile is of East Indian heritage, Pile spent hours reading the trial transcripts, transfixed by the ideal of justice represented in the account of the countries coming together to hold individuals responsible for the most heinous of acts. I am sure that those are not the only two examples that we could give in this room of individuals who have been influenced by the work of these trials. Now, until not so long ago, I had assumed that women played little, if any, role in these trials. 
my reading of Telford Taylor's Anatomy left me but one recollection of women at Nuremberg, and this is it. As some of you may know, in July of 1946, about three weeks before Robert H. Jackson delivered the prosecutor's closing statement at the first Nuremberg trial, a Paris designer invented the belly button bearing bathing suit that he called Le Bikini, named after the South Pacific Atoll at which the US had just exploded the first atomic bomb test. The bikini made its debut in Nuremberg the very same summer and obviously left an indelible impression. Here is a, an excerpt from Taylor's memoir. The occasion was a dinner party that Catherine Biddle, the wife of Judge Biddle, who was disparaged in the letter that we heard earlier, um, the American judge at Nuremberg, held for her husband's 60th birthday. It was at the villa that they had requisitioned as their home. All the members of all four delegations, the Russians, the French, the British, and the Americans were invited. It was a lovely evening, evening, Taylor wrote. The food and drink were served outdoors around the large swimming pool, and Catherine, an accomplished poetess, spoke charmingly of enduring love. And then here's the kicker. After dinner, the swimming pool was put to use. The first two in were Jenny Prado and Janine Hérisson, among the prettiest and the youngest of the French delegation, who appeared in what were soon to be known as bikinis. Few, if any of us, had previously seen these provocative garments, and the sides of the pool were soon crowded with ogling males. <laughs> and so this circa 1946 image remained for many years my own personal image of women at Nuremberg. I should say that Taylor's account is not unique in this regard. If you read many of the memoirs that were written of the time or historical accounts, there are very, very few mentions of women. Catherine Fight's name does not appear um, prominently, surely not prominently in these. The women's names you do see, and I think we should hesitate before we congratulate women for their nurturing tendencies too much because the two names that we do see are Eva Braun, Hitler's mistress who died with him in the bunker, and Ilse Koch, the wife of the Buchenwald camp uh, superintendent, known um, politely as Beast of Buchenwald, but I am sure that you can imagine the B word that was more typically used to describe her. Occasionally, you would hear of witnesses women who testified at the trials. And occasionally in some of the memoirs, there are references to Tanya Long, who was one of the New York Times correspondents at Nuremberg. Ben Ferenz said in an interview that he remembers no women at the first trial in any capacity. And surely no woman is mentioned as serving as a judge, a defense lawyer, or a prosecutor, in particular at the first trial. Thus, it is no surprise that in a 2005 speech, Judge Patricia Wald, who is, we're honored to have with us today, could name no woman among what Francis Biddle, the American judge, called the exceptionally strong supporting cast of lawyers who assisted the judges. Those lawyers who were named included two former Supreme Court law clerks and two law professors. All of them were men holding positions in the profession not then open to women. It is true that a woman did clerk for the US Supreme Court in 1944, but she was not succeeded by another woman until 1966. As for academia in that period of time, when World War II ended, the exact number of women with tenure or on the tenure track in law schools belonging to the AALS, the Law School Professional Society, was three in the entire country. It is therefore truly remarkable that the women we're about to talk about succeeded in working as lawyers at Nuremberg and in the roles that they played. Now I should say, fittingly, it was at Nuremberg, at a conference I attended with David, um, 
in a conference that began in the main courtroom at the Palace of Justice that I did learn that women, in fact, did play a role at Nuremberg. And that was thanks to a book uh, by Peter Heigl called, in English, The Nuremberg Trials. It's a tourist book with a lot of photographs in it. And what struck me was that many of the photographs included women in all the roles except judge. And so that piqued my interest and led me to begin to look more. And what I'm going to try to do today is really take you through a photo gallery um, to give you an e examples of women who worked in these proceedings, who participated in all the different ways, and then conclude by spending a little bit more time talking about one woman in particular who deserves as much attention and as much honor and memory, um, surely, as Catherine Fite. So if we begin, we see that in these random pictures I've picked up, there are women. This is a, a, a photo that I found described only as the prosecution team. There are two women in this picture. There are women in the background at a press conference of defendants in the major trial. The Rouchard case was one of the SS cases, and we see women again at the prosecution table. Here, interestingly enough, is a picture simply identified as the Soviet prosecution team, and there are two women there. I don't know what their status was, but clearly they're allowed at the council table. We've seen this picture in John's lecture of the staffers arriving for the very first time at Nuremberg, and there's Catherine Fite in the beginning. She was, of course, not the only staffer. There were some who were not lawyers at all. One of those was Virginia Gill. She's the woman with the hand above her cheek, sitting next to, I believe, Taylor. Um, and then the woman to her other side is General Clay's wife. Um, and I think General Clay may be the other gentleman there. Um, sitting and watching proceedings. She was the, essentially, chief administrative officer, cl clerk of the court if you will. Another woman who is going to have a name that some of us here recognize was Edith Simon Colliver. As Edith Simon, she was born in Germany, came to the United States, earned a bachelor's degree at Berkeley, and um, became a translator in the post-war era. In fact, she was one of the translators at the San Francisco conference that led to the adoption of the UN Charter. She makes her way to Nuremberg, and at age 23, she became a translator, um, her chief task being translating the pretrial testimony of Hermann Göring. And as she said in an interview, he was not particularly thrilled to see a woman, a Jewish woman, acting as his interpreter. At one point, they spent so much time together, because she was also translating during his interrogation, that she says, I don't know what came over me, but I had him sign a program. And then I thought, what am I doing getting an autograph from him at Nuremberg? And she felt so creeped out about it that she went to her boss and she said, would you please sign this too? I feel awkward having this. And so her boss did sign it and then put an arrow next to Goering's um, signature and said to Edith Simon, who helped hang this man. <laughs> now, the reason that some of you may recognize the name is her daughter is Sandra Colliver, who is a lawyer at Open Society Justice Initiative, had been uh, executive director of an NGO called Center for Justice and Accountability in San Francisco before that. Others were Catherine Fight, you've seen this picture, and then Elsie Douglas, who was um, Justice Jackson's secretary. There were many, many women witnesses for the simple reason that there were many, many women victims. This is a picture of three Polish survivors of the Ravensbrück concentration camp, Maria Kuzmierczyk, Władysława Karolewska, and Jadwiga Zido, talking to a nurse um, about their experience. This is a picture of, of Zido, one of the women in the other picture, um, essentially giving her testimony in silence at Nuremberg as a doctor uses her essentially as a model to explain the medical experimentation that was conducted on her legs. This is in the doctor's trial. Her testimony helped get 16 convictions in that trial 
Seven of those individuals were executed. The woman in this picture is only known as Anna M. Her privacy was protected for the reason that she was one of the victims of forced sterilization during the Nazi era. She testified in the justice trial against the judge who was responsible for the order forcing her to be sterilized. In that trial, 10 individuals were convicted, four of whom received life sentences. Other evidence also clearly implicated women. This is footage from a video, or not video, film, that was shown during one of the trials of a woman being dragged away during a demonstration. This is a photo of people being lined up for the firing squad at the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, obviously, there are many women wearing skirts in that picture. As I said, there were women who committed war crimes and atrocities during World War II. Two of them were put on trial in the principal uh, trials at Nuremberg before the American uh, Nuremberg Military Tribunal. One of them was Dr. Hertha Oberhäuser, who was a dermatologist who conducted medical experiments and was the sole woman defendant in the doctor's trial. She was convicted and received uh, 20 years but um, was released in 1952 over great outcry and in fact opened a medical practice again in Germany. Once that was discovered, a victims group got together and uh, lobbied successfully to have German Germany pull her medical license. They did not feel she had the privilege to engage in the practice of medicine after her conviction. The other defendant in one of these Nuremberg military tribunal uh, trials, the only other woman, to have been put on trial is Inga Fermetz, who was um, essentially an aide or an associate to um, an SS officer uh, in a trial called the Ruschau case, which involved the Nazi pure blood uh, programs. She was acquitted uh, at that trial. Other defendants, as I mentioned, included Ilse Koch from Buchenwald, Maria Mandel, who was an Auschwitz guard who would be executed after her conviction in a secondary proceeding. And then uh, many, many camp guards, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of camp guards who were women were prosecuted. This was the Bergen-Belsa trial, um, which I believe uh, was a British proceeding. There were journalists who were women, quite a few journalists who were women. Uh, of all nationalities. The, the woman with the pencil is an American. The women at the table are French. As I mentioned, one of the women who wrote a lot for the New York Times was Tanya Long. Um, her husband is sitting next to her. His name is Ray Daniel. They were initially assigned together overseas by the Times. She was brought on during the war. And Ray Daniel objected to her assignment and wrote back to his editors, you don't want a girl. This is a man's job. Well, she must have proved her mettle because within two years he married her and they worked together as journalists for the rest of their career. Another journalist was Erica Mann, Thomas Mann's daughter, um, known as the 20th century's most intriguing nonconformist. She was unique in her journalism because as a rather famous, or from a famous family, native German speaker, she was actually able to interview the defendants, one of the very few journalists who did that. Victoria Ocampo, an Argentine intellectual. Janet Flanner, shown here with uh, Hemingway, a colleague of hers, who wrote for The New Yorker and was quite biting and rather critical, particularly of Jackson and his cross-examination of Goering, um, and was known to uh, right in the New Yorker, much I'm sure to the dismay of the people at Nuremberg how, of how, quote, dull and incoherent, unquote, the proceedings were. Martha Gellhorn, uh, one of the wives of Ernest Hemingway, who encouraged her to become a war correspondent. She had been a fashion writer, um, and she covered the Spanish Civil War. She covered D-Day, Dachau, Nuremberg, and very late in her life, she covered the US invasion of Panama. Rebecca West, a famous English writer who wrote two books after Nuremberg um, and is said in Telford Taylor's account to have had a dalliance, what he called a brief encounter uh, with Francis Biddle during the course 
of the trial. Now, if you look at this picture for just a second, there's something here in this, this composite that I think is important to note. Two of these women were openly lesbian, Janet Flanner and Erica Mann. And I think it's interesting to remind us of how many different ways sex and gender was playing out in this very tense and, and I think chaotic word was the word that uh, John used, period, all right? There's no question the way that Janet Flanner presents herself that she would have been masculine in the time, Ari Kaman as well. Both of them lived openly with women. And so it's kind of interesting to think about that and to fold that into our story. In fact, of course, sex and gender played throughout the trials. Given Hitler's ant antipathy to what he would have called misogynization, how could it not be? Given that so much of his philosophy was about fertility, if you will, how could it not be? I found an article in the New York Times from September of 1934 where Hitler gives a speech at Nuremberg saying that the policy of Nazism is essentially to keep women in the maternity ward and that the role of women is to give children. And interestingly, he attributes any contrary ideas either to liberalism or to quote, Jewish intellectualism, unquote. So he's clearly meshing his ethnic hatreds with a very uh, uh, clear and defined role for women. Now, the perverse thing about this particular speech is it was delivered at Nuremberg to 2,000 women politicians who were Nazi activists and great supporters and organizers for the party. So I find that that, that also gives us a flavor of the tension at the time that he's putting forward this very conservative view of the women's role and asking these women to go out and make it happen when in fact the very fact of them going out is undercutting his philosophy. The victims, as I've said, many of them were women. These are women working at the AGFA, uh, now the photo company, uh, one of a uh, subsidiary of IG Farben. Um, this was a photograph that was used in the trials to talk about forced labor. The women in the very dark clothes were actually prison inmates from a prison in Munich who were forced to work here. Also from the justice trial, there, were, there was a, a lot of testimony about um, gender-related issues. I talked about the forced sterilization earlier. If you have seen the movie Justice at Nuremberg, you will recognize this as Judy Garland, who plays in that um, film a woman who is, comes to testify about the killing of her landlord. And the story was she is considered Aryan. Um, her landlord was a Jewish businessman about 30 years older than her. Uh, he was seen to have let her sit on his lap at one time. That was the full extent of any physical or sexual contact ever identified at the trial between them. He is convicted under the Nuremberg laws for quote unquote race defilement and was guillotined at a prison in Munich for that. And she comes to the justice trial. There's no picture of the actual woman. This was the best I could do. She comes to the justice trial, testifies about that event, and helps convict the judge who was responsible for that judgment. Now, there are many, many lawyers at Nuremberg, and I'm just gonna give you a list of some of the people about whom I could find very little information or for whom I could find no photographs online. Irma von Nunes gives us another echo of that issue of sort of gender identity. She uh, was admitted to the Georgia Bar at age 19 in the 20s. Um, she was a WAC captain by the time Nuremberg happens. She is said, although I haven't been able to confirm this except in one place, to be a, have been the first woman involved in the war crimes trials. I have no idea what that means. But it's interesting about her that uh, a newspaper article describes her as little Miss Von Nunes, who likes to wear her hair cut like a boy's, is very masculine and says she will never marry. And so again, there's sort of this innuendo about what kind of person, what kind of woman would get involved in these trials. Sadie Arbuthnot um, was involved in the justice case, earned her law degree 
at night school while she was a Department of Justice secretary, I presume during the New Deal, and um, goes on to become the first woman judge in the U.S. court system in Germany after the war. Of course, the U.S. held occupation of Germany for a while, and we had our own justice system. Bell Mayer Zeck worked on the Farben trial. She married William Zeck, who was um, another member of the prosecution team. She, she and he both went back to suffer in New York, I believe that's Westchester County, and became Democratic Party activists. She actually ran for the legislature unsuccessfully at one time. She uh, surfaces at age 76, writing a letter to the uh, New York Times, setting them straight on the legacy of the Nuremberg trial. I will show you that quote in a little bit. She died at age 86 in 2006, on the same day as Drexel Sprecher, another prosecutor from Nuremberg. Others about whom I've been able to find out a little bit are Dr. Aline Chalufour, and I'd like to mention her because she is actually the subject of a letter by Catherine Fight back to her parents. And she says that she had met this wonderful French woman who speaks excellent English. Apparently, the brother of Chalufour was someone that Catherine Fight had met in her earlier State Department days. And she said, it's so great to meet her because I have so little female companionship these days. And again, that's a reminder of how lon lonely these women must have been at that time. Um, Chalifour worked for de Gaulle in Canada during World War II, and she was one of three prosecutors in the Ravensbrück trial, which was a British military trial dealing with the uh, concentration camp. Interestingly enough, and I have our, our colleague Kevin Heller to thank for this observation. There were many defense attorneys at Nuremberg who were women. Perhaps this should be less of a surprise because there probably weren't a lot of male German lawyers left to be defense lawyers. And so maybe there was more of an opportunity for women in that particular role. It's also notable that, as you see, many of them had PhDs which would be a classic track in Europe. But so they were very, very educated women. A few of them, uh, Gerda Dürzer, uh, Agnes Nath Schrieber, um, their husbands were the chief counsels. They had a practice together, and so they worked as associate counsel to their husband. Um, one of the women for whom I have found a picture is Dr. Erna Kröhn, I guess it would be pronounced. Um, she was at the Farben trial and goes on to have a 30-year career as a leading music director, of all things, in Germany, in her hometown of Leverkusen. Now, perhaps from what I have found so far, the most interesting woman defense lawyer, and surely the most prominent, would have been Elisabeth Gombel, and that is because she is the only woman to have served either as a prosecutor or as a defense lawyer as chief counsel for her client. And she was the main counsel. Yes, I just heard Mr. Kaming say it. She was Bola's eternal, Ernst Wilhelm Bola, who was a foreign department officer in the Nazi administration um, and was tried in the ministries case of members of various ministries. She had been a legal advisor in the Junkers aircraft factory before the trial. And she becomes the chief counsel. Apparently, the person originally appointed dropped out for reasons I've not been able to find out. But there's a gender story here, too. And I'll read to you a quote from an account of the Nuremberg trials by a, an Illinois attorney named John Appleman and his comment about her representation of her client. He writes, the indictment in case 11, commonly called the ministry's case, was filed November 1st and served upon defendants November 4th. The defendants were arraigned on December 20th, and much to the amazement of the tribunal, prosecution, and all persons concerned, one defendant pleaded guilty. The defendant Ernst Wilhelm Bola pleaded guilty to membership of the SS with knowledge of its criminal activities, and incidentally was found guilty only upon this count and sentenced to five years imprisonment. And here's his kicker line. One wonders whether the fact that he had a woman counsel had anything to do with his decision to enter a plea of guilty. I find that a fascinating comment 
I don't know if he's saying that, of course, she was too weak to go through with actually having the entire trial, or if she was the wisest of all the lawyers because he ends up getting the shortest sentence at the end of the day. Um, I fear that it's probably the former, but the latter would hold true as well. I have pictures for three of the women prosecutors, and I want to introduce you to the first true two and then dwell on this, the last one. Uh, the first one is Dorothea, or Dottie, Greater Minskoff. She worked in the ministry's case. She was married to Emmanuel Win Minskoff, who was also a prosecutor. What's interesting here is I have found a reference to the fact that when she went back to the United States to work, I believe, for the American Bankers Association, she used her maiden name, Dottie Greater, um, and I think this is a reminder of, of humility for those of us who were on this side of the Atlantic during World War II. She used her maiden name not to hide that she was married, but because she could not be hired if she, it was found that she had married a Jewish man. And so she used her other name. And we shouldn't forget that discrimination worked more subtly, but surely was present in our own country as well. Mary Kaufman, um, a really interesting character. She worked, uh, I believe, on the Farben case, one of the industrial cases. I think she is more interesting for her life outside of Nuremberg than at Nuremberg. Um, she had been a, an organizer for the Works Progress Administration during the New Deal, went to law school part-time, and John earned her law degree at St. John's. She became a lawyer for the National Labor Relations Board, after that continuing to organize for the WPA, and eventually finds her way to Nuremberg. What's interesting about her is what she does after Nuremberg. She became one of the leading lawyers for communists uh, tried under the Smith Act during the blacklisting in the McCarthy eras. She was a leading civil rights lawyer, a lawyer for the poor. She was the lawyer of communist Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, among others, involved in a trial uh, that, uh, in which one of the co-defendants was Dashiell Hammett, was a tireless, radical attorney in this consequent years, a founding member of National Lawyers Guild, very active um, in Vietnam anti-war protests as a lawyer for people who were arrested, and in fact, developed a stump speech, if you will, which linked the war crimes of the Nuremberg era to what she saw as the war crimes of the United States during the Vietnam era. So had a very, very interesting career after her time at Nuremberg. The last person I'd like to talk about and tell you a little bit more about is Cecilia Getz. She was born in 1918 in New York City. Her father was a lawyer. She herself decided to study law and earned um, all of her degrees at NYU. She graduated at the top of her class from NYU Law School in 1940, and in fact was the editor-in-chief of the NYU Law Review, and in fact was the first woman to head any major law review in the country in history. Notwithstanding that, she could not find a job after graduation. Um, one of her classmates, explained years later. Cecilia Getz's life was truly the law. Her concentrated experience as editor-in-chief of the Law Review could not be followed by jobs in the private or judicial systems as a clerk to a judge. That was totally unavailable at the time. Limited opportunities came to be available in the federal government at the beginning of World War II when men were being drafted or otherwise joined the armed services. But even under those circumstances, she found it hard to get a job in Washington. She spent two years working in her father's firm in New York. She tried and aspired to be a trial attorney for the government. But when she tried, and I'm quoting a uh, uh, different author here, but when she tried to gain such a role, even in departments known to be headed by liberals, the prejudice against females as government litigators rose up as a solid wall. It was suggested that she was, quote, much too attractive to be a good lawyer, unquote. She persevered and eventually landed a job in the early 40s 
in the Justice Department in the Civil Division. She became the first woman ever to be offered a supervisory role in the DOJ, and she turned it down. Why did she turn it down? She decided she wanted to go to Nuremberg. She worked through the bureaucratic avenues to try to get a position in Nuremberg and found one blind alley after another. She was turned down because of her gender. She wrote at one point a, a letter saying, um, you must have nurses there, you must have secretaries there. Where are they staying, let me say there, because the reason that they gave her for turning her down was there was nowhere to put a woman, that all the barracks or whatever were reserved for men. Eventually, she went over the heads of all the bureaucrats and somehow got in touch with Taylor himself. And he, to his credit, decided quite quickly that he wanted to hire her, but there was a problem. In order for her hiring papers to be processed, Taylor had to sign a waiver of disability form, the disability being that she was a woman. He did that, and she went to Nuremberg. She worked on, in particular, the Krupp case, and in many ways was probably the most prominent of all the women at Nuremberg, both because she was one of the three major associate uh, counsel on this. She eventually became a tax lawyer. I suspect that her um, expertise in industry was invaluable. She had worked for the Office of Price Stabilization at one point. Um, and she ends up being the only woman, as far as I know, other than the one defense lawyer I mentioned, who gave an opening argument at Nuremberg. The practice then was for the prosecutors to take turns reading what was a very long opening statement. And so she is one of the five Americans that reads the opening statement at Krupp. What's interesting about that is that apparently it caused a ripple of excitement and astonishment in the courtroom to the point that when she finished reading, the second that there was a break, the British delegation in, in particular stood up and started hugging her and congratulating her on her performance. Now, the reason that I find this astonishing is that I've read the opening statement and it's nothing special. <laughs> it's clearly a script. There is no change in authorship from one reader to another. She doesn't have any really great lines. There's one line about miserable slave labor, and otherwise it's fairly plodding. Um, but it gives you a sense of how just the fact that a woman stood up and did it and didn't fall down <laughs> in the course of it, how astonishing that was at the time. She also was, was very actively engaged in um, examinations and cross-examinations of the witnesses that there were. Her cross-examinations, the excerpts that I've been able to read, reveal her as a very good lawyer. Um, the Germans, uh, like all good uh, wit hostile witnesses, uh, tried to turn the question around or dodge the question. She was very tenacious in trying to get them to answer the question posed and not accepting their, oh, well, it was somebody else or something like that. So it's quite clear that she was a very good lawyer. After Nuremberg ends, she goes back home. She works in the practice at a number of firms, including the Kay Scholler firm in New York. She focuses on tax, gets an LLM from NYU in tax, and eventually in 1978, she becomes the first woman ever appointed to the federal bankruptcy court in the Second Circuit. And she was a bankruptcy judge for the rest of her life. Um, she also was a founder of the National Association of Women's Judges and very active on behalf of women and the law. She tended to downplay her role as a first woman. She would go to those sorts of things and worked as a mentor. But in, in a line that I'd like to quote you that I found rather interesting given the recent um, vetting of Justice Sotomayor, she doesn't think that there's a difference between a woman judge and a man judge. And so I'll read you her quote 
Once you put on a robe, the male-female distinction disappears, at least as far as the people who appear before you are concerned. They don't see you as either a male or a female. The judge's role overrides the individual. I really don't see any essential difference between a good male and a good female judge. All judges must have patience, a willingness to learn, compassion, and above all, integrity. I'm afraid there's nothing very startling in all of that. Now, one of the things that's interesting about Cecilia Getz is she never writes about Nuremberg. And for my mind, this is one of the more interesting things about all of the women at Nuremberg. None of them wrote their memoirs. Unlike a lot of men on the prosecution team, a couple of them were involved sort of editors as other projects, um, but there's not even a full-on law review article by any of these women. There's only one set of remarks by Getz that's published in any law review. And there, she talks about um, why that might be. And she says, I'm very glad to be here today. It was actually a New York Law School symposium in honor of Telford Taylor, I believe, soon after he passed away. And she says, I have never spoken or written at Nure about Nuremberg, and I have myself often wondered why that is. And what's interesting is that, in part, she volunteers that it's because she was so critical of Nuremberg, that she was very embittered by the way that the industrialist trials came out. Um, in two of the three industrialist trials, the judges' panels accepted the Germans' claim that, uh, essentially of duress, Hitler made me do it, and that was an acceptable defense. She was very proud that in the trials she worked most on, Krupp, the defense was not accepted. But then later on, um, after Krupp and others were convicted, he got a very light sentence. Um, and uh, actually, I pardon that. He was sentenced. But then what happened as the case went up for administrative review through the political branches of government, Eventually, his sentence was commuted to time served, and all his property was restored, which, of course, was profoundly important um, given the expanse of the Krupp domain. And the anguish that she felt over that, even she talks about um, feeling guilty for having put certain witnesses on the stand because now that Krupp was out, she feared that they would suffer reprisals, left her with a very bitter taste about Nuremberg. She also says, it was not a happy place. She says, this was the most important work of my life and the unhappiest time of my life. This is what Nuremberg looked like in that time. And imagine what it would have been like, regardless of gender issues, to have worked in that environment of pure misery. Um, they were not allowed to fraternize with the Germans. Contrary to the justice at Nuremberg dalliance between Marlena Dietrich and Spencer Tracy, that was not condoned. And so they felt very isolated. None of them knew German. That would have isolated them anyway. They did not see the Nuremberg that I saw when I was there in 2007. And then the last thing that she says, sort of in passing, and not quite in the way that um, I think she may have meant it, was she says that there was pervasive gender bias. And what's interesting is she uses the term to describe why she had such a hard time getting hired. But of course, it couldn't have been very easy to be a woman in that environment. For any of these women, there is, after all, the bikini. <laughs>